Right. Well, we now move on to um, a, a very interesting topic. We've got Stephen Barnshaw waiting in the wings, I believe, um, probably hearing me now. He's the technical director of JHAI. Um, like many people speaking today, it's been my pleasure to know Stephen and, uh, for some time and indeed to work for Stephen. He's a, a private um, building inspector and I've um, had the pleasure of having him on um, a few of our projects um, and um, it's been invaluable being able to talk issues through with him uh, in the way um, that uh, is so critical to us understanding the work we're doing um, um, sufficiently and properly at the proper times. Um, so, a uh, chartered building surveyor and chartered building engineer, Stephen has 35 years experience in the building control profession. He has managed a range of regulatory services within the public sector and within private sector uh, approved inspectors. He has worked on a wide range of high profile buildings and frameworks and he has an interest in professional training for many years with both the RICS and uh, CABE. Um, so we're going to have a, a 15 minutes from him uh, and then a 15 minute Q&A, so keep those questions rolling. Um, and uh, Stephen, you are very welcome. Thanks for that introduction, Paul. That's very, very kind of you. Um, and, and yes, I've enjoyed working with Paul also on some, some interesting projects and we've had many an interesting discussion about um, building regulations um, and, and the proposed changes. So what I took from the last um, presentation was one, I've got an awfully short period of time in which to get through my slides. And two, how important that topic is becoming, the issue of testing and certification of products from a building control perspective and, and should have been probably on our radar for a long, long time. So. I, I'm I'm really interested in that, and I thought there was that, that's a much obviously a much wider subject that that could be discussed for a longer period of time. So let me now see if we can advance these slides. Okay, I'm I'm, I'm just going to go through a very really short and brief history lesson because I think it's really important to contextualise where we're going to with building regulations and, and the building control system. I'm going to overlap slightly probably with some stuff that Colin Blatchford-Brown did this morning, although I didn't see Colin's presentation. I've known Colin for a while, so I can sort of imagine the sort of stuff that he's he's picked up. So we've got three important dates in the world of building control and building regulations, and these are seismic dates. So 1965, the introduction of the first building regulations, then 1984, the introduction of the Building Act 1984, and this is the point where we get this part privatization of building control. So you can see the big, the big changes there. And in 2022, of course, we get the Building Safety Act. And it's, just, just from my own point of view, I do a lot of presentations about the Building Safety Act and building regulations, and it still surprises me when I get in front of an audience and I ask simply the question, how many people have heard of the Building Safety Act? How few people have actually come across it? I mean, there is, it, it, it's not, we're not getting the sort of engagement, I don't think, that's necessary um, to make the changes that are, that are going to be need to be made over the course of the next 12, 18 months. So, as I, as I alluded to just a moment ago, since 1985, we did get really big changes in the way that the building control system worked. So, for instance, we've got local authority building control been in existence, obviously, for a long time. And then we got approved inspectors. And as Paul mentioned, I work for an approved inspector, but I've also spent a long time working for local authority building control as well. I'm sort of 50-50 split, really. So we get this idea that we've got part privatization of the building control system. And that's really important. Again, I'm overlapping probably with what Colin talked about, but it's really important in us getting an understanding of our relationship, particularly you as architects, your relationship with the building inspector. That relationship would be a very, very different one pre-1984 to post-1984. And it has been a slow evolution, but my experience of the way building control works and building regulations is that that relationship has changed. And I think 
what we're going to go through is another change of that relationship. And that relationship is going to be really important in defining what your roles and responsibilities are going to be and how they're going to manifest themselves. So from October 2023, certainly for, for certain types of buildings, we're going to get two separate um, building control systems. For So for these higher risk buildings, as are defined within the Building Safety Act, neither the local authority nor approved inspectors are going to be the building control body or able to be the building control body on those projects. You're going to have a new building control body in the shape of the building safety regulator, which is which is within the HSC. And if you're in Wales, that's the uh, the Welsh government will be the building control body. I mean that, that the way the Welsh government deal with it will will manifest itself, as I say again, o over the course of the next year or so. So we get a really big change for high risk buildings, but it's not just the high risk buildings that we need to be thinking about. Okay, and I'll come back onto that in a moment. Let's just park that, but just think that we'll have two separate systems for high risk buildings and non high risk buildings. But even if you only work on non high risk buildings, the system is going to fundamentally change and your relationship with the building inspector is going to fundamentally change. Your relationship with the building regulations will change. So just thinking about fire safety, why is it important? We obviously get statistics around fire safety, uh, which are presented by the government every three months. And these, these, this graph here will show you that on the whole, we, we have been doing well with regards to reducing the number of fatalities within buildings. I mean, you'll see the, the, the blip we get there in 2018, where we get the additional deaths from the Grenfell Tower tragedy. But on the whole, the trajectory has been a downward one. So one of the fundamental um, principles around that are the ideas of why that's changed. You can see from this graph here, it's a very simple, again, analysis of, of the deaths in fires and the trajectory is a downward one. And whilst the trajectory has been a downward one, we've got an upward trajectory on the use of automatic smoke and fire detection. So one of the real positives in the way that we've dealt with fire safety over the course of the last 20 years or so. So not everything is is doom and gloom, but certainly we haven't been getting everything right, as again was talked about in the last seminar and the Grenfell tragedy talks to the idea we've not been getting everything right. And I could now have a, a conversation about the way we specify products, the way we look at testing and certification and the way we inspect products in the and, and inspect the installation of those products again, which came up in the previous seminar. So the Grenfell tragedy, but we've got other fires as well. We've got the Barking fire uh, in London in 2019. And this was a not a high risk building. This would be this is a six story building which wouldn't be triggered as a high risk building. And yet we still get a fairly catastrophic fire. No fatalities in this fire. But interestingly, this fire and the Bolton Cube fire, which similarly is a building under 18, 18 meters, both highlighted the problem with approved document B, where you've got um, information within approved document B, which seemingly allows you to include, cert include certain types of products and materials on a building, which is under 18 meters, but you still get problems. And the, and the government have issued a, a, a circular which, which highlights that fact you may have um, information within approved document B, which seemingly allows you to incorporate certain types of products, but they always default back to the actual technical requirement itself is irrespective of what approved document B says. Do you feel that the risk is adequate? Are you controlling that risk adequately when you put those materials onto that building? So the message we're getting now is, you know, it may be in approved document B, but you can't always rely on that. You've always got to default back and say, yes, I'm still irrespective of what ADB is allowing me to do. I'm still providing what I would regard as a safe building. So let's have a quick look at the principal changes that have gone on over the course of the, the few years since the Grenfell fire. So, of course, we've got the external wall fire classification, what effectively is what the government called the cladding ban under Regulation 7.2. And that, that regulation is going to go through some changes from the 1st of December. So from the 1st of December, we get new uh, and updated and amended Regulation 7.2, which brings hotels, boarding houses, 
etc into that definition of of the buildings which are controlled hotels were previously not controlled under that regulation so the external wall elements within those buildings were not controlled as highly as other residential buildings etc so we accept external wall surface finish ratings i've just talked about that the government circular said okay no matter what it says in adb about what you're putting on the surface of that building uh, you need to be still satisfied that the risk is being controlled fire door testing again goes back to the previous talkers doesn't it we have um the, we we what highlight what was highlighted after the grenfell fire was that certain types of fire doors particularly composite fire doors had only been tested on one side whereas adb is very clear that both both sides of the door need to be tested so we went through a process of some fire door manufacturers having their test certification removed and go, needing to go through that process so it attests to that idea again that we're not we haven't been looking at test certification to the adequate depth that's necessary for us to be satisfied that something is compliant we've been taking lots of test certification including bba certification at face value and that is one of the big changes we've got to think about as we go through the next year as we go through changes to ADB we're going to be looking at and changes to the whole building control process through the Building Safety Act we're going to be looking at how we evidence compliance in a much more uh, in a much stronger way so sprinklers to residential buildings being reduced from 30 meters to 11 meters in 2020 so that was quite a considerable change and then also the building safety regular start regulator starting to um, and engage in its role, its future role, by becoming a statutory consultee in the planning process. So where you get uh, what are in scope buildings, then the planners are required to consult with um, the HSE, with the BSR on, on the fire safety proposals. And there is a standard pro forma fire statement that you're required to use when you're making that, um, that planning application submission. So what's coming down the track? Well, from the 1st of December, we're going to get some changes to approved document B, but we also get some changes to the regulations. I've just talked about the, the changes to regulation 7.2. So we get external wall fire classification in terms of requirement B4 from the 1st of December also. So we're going to get some subtle changes. They're, they're very similar to the regulation 7.2 requirements. So we get some we get some limitations on the sort of products you can use in an external wall <clears throat> in Regulation 7.2 for in-scope buildings. Well, that's going to be extended to all residential buildings um, uh, uh, from, from the 1st of December uh, in, in a slightly different way. So if a building's are over 11 metres, there will be limitations which are similar to Regulation 7.2 for buildings over 11 metres. Now, it's, it's, it's a really important distinction, which I've got, if I had enough time, I could, I could talk about for a, 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 a length. But there's an important distinction between the things in Regulation 7.2, which are absolutely mandatory, and the things which are in approved document B, where there's no obligation to follow them if you want to meet the requirement in some other way. But suffice to say, from the 1st of December in flats above 11 meters, then there are going to be some changes. There are going to be some requirements and limitations on the external wall uh, products that you're going to be able to be using. So there are also going to be changes to non-residential buildings and the types of insulation of filler material that you can use um, for buildings which are over 18 meters, which doesn't exist at the moment. So we get the inclusion of evacuation alert systems under BS 8629 from uh, the 1st of December as well for blocks of flats, which are over 18 metres. And we get secure information boxes in flats, uh, which are over 11 metres. So we get some additional requirements. In terms of the evacuation alert system, this is this process whereby the fire authority can engage a simultaneous evacuation for a building which has previously been on a sort of defend in place evacuation strategy so they can make that change quite quickly uh, simply by the push of a button in the um in the alert system box so there's slightly more to that but there is going to be a requirement for flats from the first of december 
Changes to the building control process are going to come into effect on the 1st of October 2023. So we've talked briefly around those. And then, and then finally, for me, as a, as a building inspector, we get the changes to our profession from the 1st of October, wherein all building inspectors are going to be registered. So the building safety regulator is going to run a registration system, and then we will all have to go through a competency assessment to get onto that register. And again, I think this talks to the idea that your relationship with your building inspector is inevitably going to change. Um, as we go through the process. So that's about roles and responsibilities as well. So you can see here, this is a, an example of the sort of building inspector competency framework that the BSR are looking at. So there's just a consultation out for that at the moment. And we have uh, a process called the Building Safety Competency Foundation, which is, on, which is preparing a validation system for building inspectors. So again, expect building inspectors to be slightly nervous of this over the course of the next 12 months because many of them will have not faced this sort of assessment of their competence, but they will undergo that. So that from April 2024, it will legally, you will only be able to use a registered building inspector um, for that function. So more widely then, uh, as I talked about, this is not just about in-scope buildings. So just the last couple of slides. So with, with what's important to emphasize in the roles and responsibilities of duty holders. So clients, designers and contractors are all going to get statutory responsibilities. So the clients who appoint suitably competent persons, the client, designer and contractor. And these are three really important words. You must plan, manage and monitor your work to ensure that it's compliant with the regulations. Ensure is a really important word because it crops up at various places. And the client, again, to ensure that the building work is carried out to be compliant. So this talks to a really important change of emphasis. Again, I've alluded to this because it, we can talk about the content of a approved document B. We can talk about the content of the building regulations around fire safety. But what's important is about the emphasis of compliance and the emphasis of responsibility. There must be a cultural change as to when and how compliance is approached. So in the new operational standards for building control staff, it, it says here the role of a BCB, a building control body, is to assess compliance. Now, historically, in our performance standards, that has been to ensure compliance. And so that's a real change of emphasis for us to assess compliance. And we will collect evidence from the duty holders. And that will be our assessment, collecting evidence from you guys, from the clients, from the contractors to ensure that these that the building is compliant. And in terms of uh, these these operational standards, we are expected building control bodies should expect duty holders to ensure building work complies with the regulations. So it's our expectations that you will ensure that work complies, that you will provide us with sufficient evidence to show that this is compliant. So, and this again goes back to the previous um, speakers in terms of certification, in terms of testing, in terms of inspection and identification of installation being in accordance with that certificate and that testing. That's where all of this is going to be, be fought over the course of the next, or, or over these changes. And of course, you know, there are big penalties for these things. So the time limit for prosecution of building regulation offences has, has been extended to 10 years. There were inclusion now for local authorities and the safety regulator of stop notices, of compliance notices. So things that will create barriers to moving the work forward if there are, is there is evidence of non-compliances on the site. Prosecution for companies for a breach, particularly where that breach comes from somebody withholding information or hiding information through consent or connivance. So again, important, um, important milestones, important things that you need to be aware of when you're exercising your responsibilities. So that's, that's just about covered me. It's a whistle stop, an absolute whistle stop, Paul, um, through those, those slides. Well, and I hope there's a, enough information for us to uh, go through some questions. Yeah, we've got some questions already for you. They've been ro rolling in again, um, but I want to kick off with one <coughs> straight away, uh, but I'll run that question after a comment. Um, 
Uh, the comment is from somebody talking about gaming the system, which I think is terminology we all know understand. Yes. So I don't have to explain that. But uh, Andrew Fern has written in at 11.53 and said, architects are in a buyer beware market where we need to scrutinize a BBA, a fire test certificate, including all the products that were used in the fire rig test, including fixings. And there, uh, are there any ways to streamline this process to make it more transparent? The current process is rather convoluted. And that goes straight to the point that was made by our previous um, speakers who um, you, you will have been listening to, I think, Jonathan and Chris, who raised some questions about the, um, the value of the, um, or, uh, of the uh, BBA certificates in the context of fire, um, which I think has been a shock to a lot of delegates. Um, so can you just address that issue, um, really, which is, it's terribly difficult for everybody specifying. I'm not going to keep saying architects. Everybody specifying. They've got such a lot of information to get through. Um, and how can we make sure those certificates are more robust and reliable and in the same language as the building regulations? I think, I think Paul, it's a really interesting one. I, I, I've, I've, dealt with a, I've dealt with a question this morning which talks to this thing. Um, I've had a, um, a product presented to us through one of our surveyors. Now, this product has been looked at by presumably the client. It's been looked at by the architect, by the contractor, by the, the, the fire engineering consultant. Then it's gone to our surveyor and it's come to me. So, and when I've opened the declaration of performance for this, require, this, this product, it's, this is an, a composite external wall panel. And when you look uh, and we're looking at the external fire classification of this panel in its proximity to the boundary. And when I looked at the declaration of performance for that, it was very clear that the product had been tested and had it had the right classification. So it was class B, et cetera, um, but it was only to the internal face. And it was being presented um, as, as compliant with the requirement B4, which is specific to the external face. So this has got, we've got to go back. It's been, that's been through layers of people before it got to me. Uh, and, okay. and we noticed okay. that, you know, the test certification is, is specific to the internal face of the panel only. Okay. So okay. what we've got to get is to a point where manufacturers provide that clarity. Well, this takes they, us into the issue of this takes us into yes, the issue of culture, which was raised from the beginning as well. Yeah. But that question was from Andrew Fern. Uh, Liam Ross, I don't think we need to answer this one, but it's just a point that he makes. The testing regime failed to control actual construction. Insurers have lost confidence in testing. And, uh, uh, and as a result, architect's liability has escalated. Um, I think the, the territory that I'm really interested in with you um, is this um, building safety regulator, uh, will private inspectors be able to become building safety regulators? Are they going to be state employed or are they private companies? Can you explain that bit? Yeah, 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 I can. The, build, the building safety regulator is, a, is an organisation which is currently being constructed within the HSC. So the building, is, the building safety regulator is a is a regulatory authority all of its own right okay so it, it has the same status as local authority building control services so nobody can become a, a building safety regulator there is just one and what's happening in effect is the building safety regulator is taking over responsibility for looking at building safety in in scope buildings so these high risk buildings it, it will be the only building control body you can use but it is also taking over responsibility for the whole building control system so approved inspectors um, from october next year approved inspectors will no longer be known as approved inspectors we're going to be called building control approvers and all will be able to apply for a new license through the building safety regulator so the building safety regulator has many many functions and many responsibilities. Not only is it the only building control body you can use for high risk buildings, but it is also going to manage and oversee the whole building control right. profession. So and then I've it's got, also going to manage those buildings in occupation as well. Right, so if I've got this right, we're yep. going to carry on with the system that got introduced after the 85, which is that we can have private building inspectors as well as local authorities. And as I understand yep. it, at the beginning of a project, one can opt to go for a private building inspector, 
instead of the mm. local authority, and the local authority yes. gets notified, and then that's the end of that. That's going to carry on, but you're going to have a different name. But both yep. of you, private and local authorities, will be answerable to the building um, safety regulator, who will That's also correct. take a personal involvement in p buildings of particular risk and com it's, risk because it's slightly, of their use it, complexity. It's, yeah, it's slightly more than that. So what you described, the, the, the process of you being able to choose your building control body from the private or the yeah. public, that stays the same for all buildings apart from one type of building. And that is buildings with a, a sleeping risk which have a floor more than 18 meters above the ground. If you've okay. got one of those, then you will not be able to use the private or the local authority. You, will need, you can't use either of those. You will only have the building safety regulator as your building control body. And that's going to be what, in somewhere like Bristol or Newcastle or London, but that's a single office and that regulator, the building regulator will presumably have many officers who discharge those duties. Yeah, yeah, that's, there's no real yeah. clear um, structure of it as yet, but yes, uh, I mean, at the moment it's, it's head offices up in Bootle in, uh, in Liverpool, so yeah. Okay, um, here's uh, one to end on and it's one from me. Um, I was somewhat aghast when private inspectors came on stream. And I have to say, actually, that until I met one or two of whom you're one of the two, I had little respect or faith for that territory. I'm sure that maybe I'm being unfair there, but I didn't. And then I met a couple of really good ones with whom I felt I could rely and be guided through complex material. Is it fair to say that that's a, uh, uh, an industry that needs to clean up its act as well? Or do you think all has been well in that territory? I do. I, I, Not an I, industry to be profession. Fair, to, to be fair, Paul, I think um, I've met many very, very good building control surveyors in the private sector whose philosophy and the way they do the job and professionalism and competence is, is no different than it probably was when they worked within a local authority environment. It didn't change just because they went to work in the private sector. So, and, and I think probably both parts of the building control system in terms of the private and public sector have good and bad like any profession. So um, I'm a bit of a sitting on the fence answer, but I think there's good and bad in all sides. But I think, no, that... I think it's the whole building control system that needs yeah. well, that's, to that's good. Be become better. Yeah, that's, yeah that's, that's good because I like to end on a hopeful note and I've had good experience through the system. There are other architects who wouldn't speak well of any part of it. I've had good experience, mm. very, very good experience. Um, but I had a, a feeling that um, you know, they're, they're, that might not be universal. To hear you speaking of a profession of private inspectors amongst whom there are many that you respect is good news and um, they've certainly got a lot to do. <laughs> okay, yeah. well look, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. We're going to move on to our next session. Um, I look yeah. forward to speaking to you again soon.